Uh, don't open it yet. All right, maybe open. Hello, Internet. Oh, perfect. Well, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Microsoft Reactor and to Stockholm Machine Learning Club. I put the welcome back sign here. I realize this is probably, for most of you, the first time here, so it's not really a, a welcome back, but welcome. Uh, a little bit about the space that we're in first. Uh, so the Microsoft Reactor is essentially an investment space uh, from Microsoft to host events like this for community events, but we also hold uh, other workshops, uh, whether they're covering things like AI and ML or any sort of technology or startups. So we actually have one coming up, which will be me uh, speaking at it, uh, about building your first AI project. So if you are interested in machine learning or AI and you've never done anything before and maybe you think some of the things you might hear about today is still so so much to you, uh, this is going to be kind of a walkthrough of how to actually get started building uh, an AI project. And, uh, you know, we talk about Azure and we talk about Microsoft products, but this is not just a place to sell Microsoft products, so we're completely open to other technologies and things like that. So if you are interested in hosting a talk or hosting another meetup here, uh, let Erica know. She's the program manager and she manages the schedule. I'm just the guy with the microphone. Um, but yeah, Saco Machine Learning. So uh, it's been actually 811 days since our last meeting. <laughs> so quite a long time. Um, the last meeting was our supposed to be our one year anniversary of this meetup. Uh, so I promised everyone cake. And I actually delivered. I bought, we were so close to actually having this meetup. It was like really, really close for the pandemic. I actually went out and purchased a cake, and I froze that cake for many, many days, thinking this will blow over in three months, uh, we'll all be meeting back, we'll get some hand sanitizer and be fine. Obviously, that did not happen, and I held on to the cake uh, for about 600 days. Uh, then I had a moment of weakness, uh, and I ate the cake. So that's why there's no cake for you today. Uh, but hopefully, maybe our two-year anniversary, there's not going to be any um, sort of global pandemic or something that will ruin that celebration. Um, but yeah, what we are about here. Uh, so we, the joke is that we would love to be called the Stockholm Machine Learning Learning Club, uh, but meetup.com does not allow that many characters in a meetup name. Uh, but that really is the core of this group, is to be able to educate and provide thing, knowledge and share that out. So even if you're not an expert in machine learning or not even working in machine learning or AI now, uh, this is a safe space for you to come, one, learn about things and also share uh, the topics. So even if you are starting out and you just found out about what a neural network is, it's completely cool for you to come uh, and do a talk about what a neural network is because there probably is someone in the audience uh, who doesn't know that. And even if they do, it's always great to get a new perspective on a topic that we all know and love. So again, really about learning. Our first meeting, I think we had a high school student, a designer from a bank, and a few PhDs. Uh, so it was quite a spread of knowledge. And then Randomly me, I don't know where I fit in that category. Um, so yeah, again, everyone is welcome, whatever you're doing. Uh, it's all about the interest of machine learning and AI. Uh, and actually, the cost of membership. So I don't know if anyone paid anything to <laughs> come here, but membership is completely free. But there is one small cost, is that uh, we hope one day that you will speak here, um, because we don't come and pay anyone to speak or we don't get some famous people to come do amazing talks. We have a visitor today, but he was just in town. We didn't pay him to come. Um, so, uh, you know, we don't have meetups if we don't have speakers. And I got really smart, and I put in a little survey question. Uh, when you join the meetup now, if you say, like, yes, no, or maybe. So if you said yes, I will definitely find you to do a speak speech. Uh, if you said maybe, I will also find you. And if you said no, uh, that's a maybe in my eyes. So probably in a couple of months, you will be up here speaking, hopefully. Uh, so, yeah, it, we really dr driven this by people volunteering and doing talks. And you can join these amazing people who have done talks in the past. Some are in the audience today, or at least one. <laughs> uh, so we've had a, quite a grab bag of topics, as you can see. So we had something about uh, reverse engineering uh, and using AI. Uh, just a general talk about NLP, like a survey of what NLP is and what it does. 
Um, even predicting crypto prices, that's always hot. And AI and ML can do that sort of stuff. At intro to TensorFlow, so nice. We like to see code, so it was a nice coding workshop as well. John, who's in the audience, can tell me exactly how to say that word again because I always forget. What is it again? Nefertafel. Yeah, some Viking chess game. That's how I looked it up. I was like, I remember Viking ch chess, and it came up first hit. So he built a bot to play that game. Uh, and then we also have two great speakers, and Aisha completely messed up and didn't put that there, but you'll be talking about uh, AI and education. And Alan, uh, I put this as Gans Dance, or Dance Gans, I don't know, something. Uh, but he will also be talking that. So you could be on this board uh, next time. And, and speaking of next time, so like I said, we have um, uh, one meetup here with, through the reactor. So we have a meetup group that's separate. Uh, if you want to join and you're interested in those sorts of things, um, we also have a climate hackathon coming up in partnership with our sister uh, meetup group, Oslo AI. So like the slightly richer, more oil field. Uh, Stockholm Machine Learning Club, and they are doing something with the climate. I have the more details I'll post on the meetup group. It'd be super cool if we could make a team together uh, and win it. That would be great for Sweden. Um, and, and then, yeah, so that would be from the 7th to the 9th. There'll be more details there. And then our next uh, meetup, actually, uh, will be June 8th, and it won't be building your first AI project. So that will also be uh, on there. So it'll be hopefully some two lucky individuals I'll find to speak on that. And maybe since it's between... And this climate hackathon, if you're interested in like sustainability or green AI or any of that stuff, would love to have you talk here so we can be like on brand. Uh, but yeah, so today's event is kind of special. Uh, so normally we have two speakers, uh, like a break, and then another speaker comes. But we actually have a guest today, uh, all the way from the Netherlands. I think that's how you say it. <laughs> um, and he actually hosts a show called A Bit of AI, but I won't steal his thunder. Uh, you can go ahead and explain what that is and how we're going to run the event today. Cool. You're going to set up all the camera. Yeah, where are you going to stand exactly? So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm like moving around and you're like, so no, there you perfect. go. Cool. Thank you and thanks for everyone joining here. It's going to be a really good um, evening. So we have like two talks tonight. We're going to do that first, like 45 minutes, 45 minutes. And then we're going to dive into a panel, a panel that is called the A Bit of AI Show. And the A Bit of AI Show is all about how people learn in tech and how they actually got into the field of AI. So I'm going to invite the speakers of today and Corey up to the stage to do like a small panel with, with me. I will ask some questions about what they studied, what they are exciting about in AI, and then um, there is a lot of time for your questions. Like, if you want to start a career in AI, kind of where do you start? And these people, these people will know the answer, or maybe I will know it. So that is going to be the program for today, and the show will be kind of live recorded and live streamed from this camera, and then later on we will add sign language to it, and the show will be published on the Microsoft channels. So if you have a question, just wait for me to bring you the microphone so you are also in the stream or feel free to come up. So then I think we're going to try and see if the screen share is going to work <laughs> and invite our first speaker onto the, onto the stage. Did I forget anything? Code of conduct? All good. All good, all covered here? Perfect. Cool. <laughs>
administrator at Department of Computer and Technology University, and uh, I'm working in the area of technology enhanced learning. Um, I'm working uh, in AI domain, uh, AI area of uh, in education, and also building tool AI based tool to assist students, teachers, and educators. From last five years, I'm working in um, uh, machine learning, and also from uh, and also other uh, by using other uh, uh, techniques of AI in the uh, healthcare domain as well as in education. But in last three years, my focus was on education domain. So um, I wrote some papers, some I have some conference uh, publications, conference paper publications, some journal articles. Uh, okay, the agenda of my today's presentation is here. Firstly, I will tell about the role of AI in education domain. After that, I will tell about which kind of techniques are being used in education uh, by using uh, AI like machine learning, learning analytics, explainable AI, and NLP. And after that, I will uh, explain that how these techniques are used in different use cases, like prediction of student knowledge level, uh, to predict that what will be the student knowledge level and how much grade he will get uh, in his final exam, this kind of information, and also to self-regulate students. Uh, self-regulation means uh, to make students uh, in this way because nowadays uh, students go to classes, they are very big classes, like you know, massive open online courses are there. So uh, it's very difficult for students that uh, which kind of material they, sh they should study and which uh, kind of material they should not study. So uh, we develop tool that self-regulate students, tell to the students which kind of uh, reading material you should read and you will get good grades in your exams. And also we develop tools for teachers for personalized learning of students because different students have different learning ability. They cannot, some students can easily capture different things. Some students cannot easily capture. So they have different levels. Uh, by using these tools, these tools basically provide the personalized support to the students. Uh, uh, because uh, we use these techniques, uh, 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 especially explainable AI, explainable AI or machine learning techniques we use in it, in these tools, and uh, uh, these provide uh, personalized and adaptive support to the students. And, and uh, in this way, it facilitates to teachers because um, when there are many students, you know, uh, in machine learning and deep learning courses, uh, there are many students. They are taking they are taking uh, in online classes and even in physical. Also, there are many students. So uh, teachers cannot uh, uh, provide personalized support to each and every student because each student has different uh, uh, cognitive ability they have. But by using these tools, that I will give you a demo at the end. Uh, by using this tool, students can get personalized support. And also, um, this, uh, uh, these tools are useful uh, for the quality education at educators level, like institutions. So, and at the end, I will show you the demo in which I, uh, we use these techniques and, uh, and these are the use cases of them. So now first the question is what is AI in education? It's basically the implication of artificial intelligence in, uh, to facilitate different stakeholders in the education sector. Well, this definition is a little bit vague, so need to clarify it. Which are the stakeholders, which facilities, and how to facilitate? So uh, there are many different stakeholders of an education domain like students, teachers, educators, tutors, mentors, researchers, organizations, all are the uh, stakeholders, but, uh, uh, but our focus in, in our work is uh, students, teachers, and educators. Um, and also, the, what kind of facilities are provided? Uh, these are like, uh, uh, as, as I told you in, uh, in my previous slide, that personalized support to the students and also the uh, provide intelligent recommendations to the students. Uh, they, they could get good grades in their exams. 
uh, this kind of facilities for students, for teachers to support them, uh, to uh, structure their uh, curriculum in, a, in this way that students can get uh, uh, easy, easy to understand them, this kind of information. And for uh, educators, how to facilitate the educators? Like uh, uh, to improve their passing, passing out rate of the students and decline the dropping out rate of students. Obviously, when their passing out rate will increase, then obviously the repute of that educator will go to up. So how to provide these facilities? By using uh, different AI techniques. The next slides are about this. So firstly, um, I will tell about the knowledge tracing, in which we use techniques of learning analytics and machine learning. Knowledge tracing is basically to track student knowledge data and predict their performance in the future. Like, um, it has basically two major applications, like assessment level and question level. In assessment level, uh, knowledge tracing is like this. Students' data during the course is collected, like, uh, um, for example, uh, if uh, you want to uh, predict that what is the student's performance in, in his uh, third or fourth uh, assignment or quiz, then you take data from the previous uh, assessments and what was the score in the previous assessment and also the log data that how, which uh, reading material he studied, which concepts he studied, uh, and uh, which kind of lecture slides he studied, and because everything is uh, is on a learning management system, because uh, in each and every learning environment, learning management system are uses like Moodle and this kind of. So this kind, this data is collected, and after performing some analysis, that is called learning analysis, learning analytics, that lies under the learning analytics. So after performing uh, analysis on this data, it is find out that uh, what will be the performance in the upcoming quizzes or assignment during the course. And it is very useful for students because students get motivated that if they, find they, if they get this uh, uh, prediction that they will fail, then obviously they will, they will <laughs> try to uh, try their best to uh, more study and uh, to get uh, to get pass in their exam so and also in question level knowledge tracing performance prediction uh, in question while uh, while exam uh, while attempting in exam it's like this students are sitting in an examination hall and they are de they are doing uh, they're doing exam or attempting a quiz so uh, this question level knowledge tracing is very interesting like this that it tells that uh, whether the next question student is going to attempt, it will be correct or not, based on the previous data. It's, so it's a combination of learning analytics, analysis of the student's learning data, and the machine learning that performs the prediction. Well, uh, here is uh, uh, some uh, vector representation of this assessment level knowledge tracing, like student's LMS data is collected, that consists of his scores and also the uh, students' uh, views and that log data that, that provides students' views that uh, how, how long he watched the different video reading material, for how long time he studied the different reading material. So this kind of information is given here. After preprocessing, then feature engineering, new features are, um, feature engineering is basically that the uh, data gives some feature, and based on those features, new features are derived. So feature engineering is conducted there, and after that, ML model building happens, and, and after, after that, some, uh, it is uh, prediction or classification, if uh, we perform any classification algorithm. Uh, for classification, we perform ML model building, then uh, it classifies the student uh, high achiever means that the student will get high grades or low, gra or low grades in their exams. And this is the question level knowledge tracing. It's from my one paper. Um, the other uh, process is the same, student data, preprocessing, feature engineering. This is the basic thing that, that, uh, that are used in 
um, in this question level knowledge tracing. It's basically an ensemble approach. I used a light gradient boosting machine uh, algorithm uh, model and self, uh, self uh, multi-headed self-tension knowledge tracing model. So uh, by using these, their prediction, I, uh, I assigned their weight based on their predictive outcomes and find out that whether the next question that a student is going to attempt, it will be correct or not. And, and another difference between this and this previous slide is that that here uh, is the student's LMS data, but here is the questions data. Questions data is when, when we take the questions data, then uh, question, uh, questions, what are the concepts are in, in questions? They are uh, uh, used in it uh, and context, context analysis is conducted like by this model. And now uh, go to the next use case, and uh, it's by using explainable AI. It's a very hot area nowadays. So every, uh, in every domain it's used, healthcare, education. So uh, it basically tells about the reason of predictive outcomes, that how, uh, how uh, this model uh, find out this, this particular uh, prediction. What is the reason? So for example, if, uh, if in previous slide I showed you that the prediction was high achiever and low achiever, then this uh, explainable AI basically tells then why, how, how he, can, he will be high achiever and how he will be the low achiever, uh, why a student will fail, what is the reason? So uh, this explainable AI explains these things. It delivers explanations of the predictions provided by machine learning. So the, uh, it's, uh, it's many use cases are, firstly, uh, it's very significant to provide intelligent recommendation to students about their studies. It's self-regulate students. It's useful to get good grades in exams. So I will now, I will explain uh, in next slide, explainable AI to support student self-regulation how it self-regulates the student by using explainable AI. This is uh, just a, a picture like a person, uh, there is a student who self who's uh, who following this uh, self-regulation and then gets success. So, but uh, it means that self-regulation is something that need to provide students. So how it can be provided by explainable AI? So how explainable AI works? This is the uh, log data, and it's basically the different student uh, massive on MOOC, like massive open online courses. Many students are, are enrolled, and they are learning by online. So the data is taken, uh, and all of the students who are taking online courses, they are basically uh, studying by uh, by a dashboard. The, uh, behind that ba dashboard is any LMS that's called learning management system. So Moodle is a very popular. Many universities are using, and in our university, Stockholm University, Moodle is used. Uh, many students are studying there. So um, it's a basically uh, um, this work that uh, I'm going to show you. It's from uh, Stockholm University uh, uh, data, students' data that we collected from uh, uh, a programming course, Python programming course. So uh, we collected students' data. It was about different activities. Each course has different modules in which there are different activities. So these are different activities, like students are set to uh, watch videos and different uh, reading material, and also there are some quizzes, assignments. So in our work, we, our focus was on these quizzes and assignments to get uh, that what were the students' grades in these uh, assessment tasks. And then we applied explainable AI, AI on it. It's basically um, different models are used in explainable AI model agnostic approach we used in the previous work by using Lime library. Example-based 
approach we used in this work and this and use the counterfactuals um, it's a very uh, it, it's also very uh, pretty uh, hot area uh, people are working in it uh, in different domains so uh, it was very useful in it because first we used this it, uh, it but uh, it is it didn't provide us the better results and better performance but it worked very well and uh, and after implementation it it basically tells about these are the features these are the student features what are the student score in quiz 1 what is the student concept level score in a in a quiz and also the uh, the different uh, features actual values are given here and this is uh, basically the data of one student who was actually current time was low achiever he will he will, he will get less grades it he was a low achiever we took his data and provide and applied counterfactual explanations that is basically explainable ai when we applied over it then that all algorithm gave us some results that if student for example if he he's getting programming knowledge his programming knowledge has uh, is giving 50 and if he will get 75 score and similarly in all features these updated scores then he will be high achiever so in uh, and, uh, and this algorithm basically gives many counterfactual explanations. So the most prior run we take and then deliver to student. And it's very useful to provide student recommendations that you have to do like, for example, uh, this is, uh, and, and student, student is told that uh, programming knowledge, if you get this uh, study to this level or to, till this time, then you will get 75 score. So then you, you can get good grades as, uh, because the, your current status is low achiever. Then you will achieve the high achiever status. So in this way, this um, technology works. And then this is the development that was implementation. And this is a, a, this is a prototype of that work in which this is the uh, prediction that what was a student's prediction that he will be high achiever or low achiever what is the prediction 30 percent chances and 70 percent chances and here is the recommendations are given <coughs> next comes natural language processing in education it's a it's a very powerful tool it provides many useful applications in the area of education uh, we have developed and still working uh, in on one application we have worked and the other one we are still working first is a knowledge based students grouping because in courses there are many students it's very difficult for students to tackle each and every student based on their no, their learning ability so group students based on their learn, their uh, learning level their learning uh, students uh, understanding level knowledge ability so they are separated uh, uh, group group them and the other application is the access automatically exercise generation for these specific groups because <clears throat> it's very it's pretty easy to give uh, exercises to student, okay, you do this. You will, you, uh, you. It's very important for your practice. But to deliver exercises that are according to their uh, understanding level, to improve, uh, to targeting a particular uh, number, a particular groups, they they have same uh, understanding level, and to deliver these those exercises based on this, considering this uh, scenario, then it will be more useful for the students considering all these uh, ideas we we worked on it so okay now uh, knowledge based students grouping it is the nlp plays an important role uh, based on their understanding about different learning concepts in a course one course there are different concepts like if you take python there are looping concepts conditions and uh, some other like uh, uh, 
there is a if else condition switch statement. So there are different concepts. To then uh, what is uh, what is done in this work in this application that students' understanding based on these concepts is find out, and the students who have who have uh, almost same understanding about this particular set of concepts in a course, then they are grouped. So the, this, is, this is the basic idea behind this application. And, and, and we call it the, these are uh, different knowledge groups of students. And it's very uh, useful to provide them personalized support and also uh, collaborative, uh, collaborative learning. It's a very, uh, uh, it's a, a very uh, famous, and people like to collaborate with each other and work. So, uh, when different students group together, then they collaboratively work, and uh, and it's, it facilitates to teacher teachers to provide them personal, personalized support. And this is the. Uh, pictorial and, uh, uh, representation here is the, uh, for example, there there is a cheat, uh, there is an answer sheet in which in an answer sheet there are questions, answers, and score of each question is given there. So when questions are extracted, then from each uh, each question is basically targeting some uh, concepts, one or two concepts, or a one particular concept. So concept extraction is done, how concept extraction is done, spotlight, many other concept extraction algorithms or uh, methods are there. So you can use it. So this concept extraction is done. And after collecting the concepts and the scores of the student, we cluster the students and different knowledge groups are done. And now is the automatic exercise generation based on students. It is, its aim is also the same of improving their concepts understanding because uh, such grouping helps in different ways to self-regulate, to provide adaptive support, and self-directed learning. And uh, here is a picture that not different knowledge groups, each knowledge group uh, is a group of students who have same understanding level. And then the concepts, all concepts that uh, the, their understanding level for different concepts, these concepts are given to the uh, uh, books, are matched with the, uh, to given to these books, PDFs, and lecture slides. They are studied uh, during the course. And then based on these uh, uh, concepts, and the, the text is generated is taken from this these uh, material is reading material and then that text is given to the NLP pre-trained model different models you can use uh, unified le uh, learning uh, language model it's, it's also very uh, good uh, it is used and then question and their answer generation it's automatic generation uh, of uh, exercises and obviously helpful for teachers uh, and uh, also for students and now here is a demo. Uh, it's not, sorry, uh, I, I could not share the, uh, it's uh, a direct link, it's just a picture. So uh, at the top, there is a student's current status, like student is getting B grade, and there are the how many exercises, lecture assignments, and theoretical exercises he has attempted. And here is the link, uh, here is the click, when you click it, you can set that uh, that grade you want to achieve. For example, here is a student. If you want to achieve the grade A, this you have to click on A, and the recommendations are given there. And uh, it will be that you should read this, you should read this. It's basically based on counterfactual explanation that I told you at the start that uh, counterfactual explanations generate these recommendations. And even also tell them that uh, the priority of uh, this, uh, if you will do this uh, task, then its priority is middle. And if you go this task, its priority is high. You will early get your uh, target. You will uh, early become the high achiever. 
and if you will do this, its priority is low, so it will take time. And here is the NLP applied to generate exercises. So just student click on it, and a quiz open that is based on his current knowledge status. And uh, the all uh, exercise uh, is given. He attempts all the uh, questions. And at the end, there is solution also. So well, it's all about uh, education, AI in education. <laughs> Yeah. Any question? Yeah. <laughs> we also have online questions. Oh, yeah. perfect. Then you can have that microphone. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah, on the online. Okay. No, yeah. they, won't. they can't respond to it. Yeah, it, it's very simple. Uh, you have an example there from Stockholm University, the Nolde, right? Uh, and the problem, of course, with AI and so on is the data in. So if I'm doing, say, an introductory course in programming, <coughs> it's very likely I don't do the exercises of the learning platform. I will do exercises that I find online or something like because they are a lot better. And mm -hmm. then you don't have any data of, at, at least not for the, the students that work the most. Uh, oh. and actually try to find material to work with. So how do you handle that? Do you like incentivize students? I mean, if it was something with work, you could just say you have to work with this platform, but. Like, um, actually we worked uh, for one course that was a Python programming course that I told you for Stockholm University. And uh, if you talk about, basically we take data of student LMS data, learning management system data, so th that is Moodle, uh, mostly. In yeah, I, I, I know about Moodle and I use it. I don't like it. But the, 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 the question is, I mean, if I'm doing uh, an introductory programming course, I will have access to lots and lots of mocks. And the, the tail end on the mocks will be a lot better than the course at Stockholm University. Even uh, if it's the best course at Stockholm University available, the tail end, upper tail end of the mocks will be a lot better. And I will have ex exercises in programming in, in, on a lot of online platforms. And obviously, for I mean, you can't track what I'm doing. Even if you tried it, it you wouldn't be uh, be allowed to, to actually track what I'm doing on all the external platforms. So you won't get the data f where I train as a student and so on. So uh, if I'm then having an exam in the end, you will have all these students. Why is he getting an A? He hasn't done any work, right? So no, you, will, uh, you will get all these. I, I understood your question. No, uh, we can get data. There are some libraries you have to use, and you can access data. But uh, before accessing data, you have to take permission from the tutor. And after that, you can. Uh, it's, it's easy. You can get data from Moodle. It's log data. It's easily accessible. And also the other information, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, you have to use a, a, a pixel or something if you want to track me externally outside of Moodle. And if I'm doing the programming learning, I will do it most, mostly outside of Moodle. Can so, I please yeah, give sure. an example? <laughs> uh, for example, we are studying uh, in our class, AI business, uh, business consultants. Uh, we had a write code module as hmm. well. Uh, we were provided data camp, but almost half of the class went on YouTube instead mm -hmm. and did exercises on their own. How can then that be logged into the system? YouTube versus the, data camp. Okay, this, uh, this system, uh, basically the exercises, the data, the log data, we basically collect the, uh, the students uh, that when, for example, he go to Moodle, he checks, he reads different reading material, he uh, watch different videos, this data is collected. The log data means this data. His views, we capture his views that how, uh, uh, at this page, uh, how many times he went, for how long he, he stayed there, based on that. Okay, these are the basic features and these features are used for using uh, further for counterfactual explanation, for explainable AI. So basic data is like this. 
Uh, yes, I, I think uh, your folks for model and uh, both of them uh, ask you if they use another resource is not in the model. And I know that many teacher design is not good enough because the students, the, the, most of the model, I, I know the teacher just deliver the material on the platform. This mm -hmm. doesn't uh, help for learning. My another question, this is you just use one course and maybe, I, I don't know, the, 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 the uh, teacher design the course is really good for students. And they have other model course, maybe the teacher design is really poor. How you use this AI predict students' competence? And, and yes, and you use the knowledge, use the base of the QuizNet, but maybe ma many QuizNet just use uh, multiple choice, right or wrong, but this is not just simply test the students' uh, knowledge. It's not really the competence. How do you use AI to improve for this kind of situation? Look, uh, any AI technique, it, basically we use the previous data, okay? The data that students perform previously work. Either it's assessments or either it's views or this kind of information. We worked on Moodle because uh, uh, in Stockholm University, Moodle is used. So I have idea on Moodle, about Moodle, but uh, didn't work on other LMS that you are talking about. But Moodle is, I think, so it's the, it's the popular one and, it, and it's the top notch LMS. So, uh, and it captures, it, it has every, every features that you are discussing. So. Many, many schools have beat the platform. They Sorry? Many, many schools beat the learning management system. It doesn't many use model anymore. Even I know that many universities use, use Canvas, uh, like many schools in, uh, in Stockholm for, for um, York school uh, or any other high school, maybe they use Teams, use Google Suite. Mm -hmm. So they have different, they have many, many different learning platforms. How you can use this kind of AI to improve? Yeah, I, just because I don't think you work for Google, okay. so you don't, we don't have to, you know, I don't know if anyone's working for Google here. Um, but to, for this point, I think it's really great because you're illustrating using these techniques, you could probably expand to other data camp or more preferable things. And you're just showing us how you, in this experiment, use those techniques and we can apply them to something else. So, bad Moodle, everything else good. <laughs> yeah. no, that, 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 that was actually uh, where I was heading. I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna keep yeah. to the most important. Uh, so this is being developed mostly for, I guess your target is universities going into the online yes, education uh, or is it yeah. marks in general? Is it upskilling in businesses? What no, it? basically our target is the uh, higher studies, online courses like MOOC, massive okay. open online courses. We are targeting this and also the other, uh, we are uh, mm, testing this tool on mm. uh, the currently on Stockholm University data, but our target is to capture these uh, courses like courses in different Okay, so the, f the framework of what you're going to learn is kind of established and set on certain, how to say, KPIs or like uh, certain achievement levels, so to say. So, uh, uh, no, I, I, as I said, like if you're going for higher studies, then they have already uh, a lot of um, a, a learning program that they students need to have come up to a certain level. So it's, it's, it's quite easy to then understand which level the student needs to be at. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you would expand it into other subjects than just programming, how would you go about it? The, diff uh, the other courses, like courses, basically th this is a problem that course data varies, course to course data varies. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult that you uh, make a tool, just one tool that is applicable for all course, uh, all all kind of courses. Like for example, if I develop tool for Python or, or different programming courses, uh, and then you use it for in social sciences like uh, history or this, no, it it will be because data will be different in that. But mm -hmm. when you use, for example, the student, they are also using that uh, uh, learning management system that. For this, uh, considering this, I used, I developed this. 
So then, uh, then it, it, it becomes uh, a little bit more easy. But if uh, uh, the, for example, uh, in programming courses, you are given uh, the uh, questions are basically uh, are decoding. You have to complete this code, or uh, you have to find out uh, this kind of which is the mistake in this code. But on the other hand, if there is a history course, history course, or any other social science course, so obviously it will uh, difficult. So uh, that's why it's very it's it's not easy to to make a tool that is generalized for all courses. So it doesn't fit. <laughs> now, another approach can be you categorize different courses, like all programming courses. You make a tool for all other social sciences courses. Their features are resemble the data structure is same. You make another. So. Cool. So we're going to take uh, one more question from this lovely person online, and then uh, you can obviously come talk to her, and then we'll take a break for Alan's speech. Okay, I have three questions from the same person. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm just going to choose <laughs> one, uh, the longest question, <laughs> uh, or the last one. Um, we are still. So John Mason says. We are still reco recovering from a once-in-a-generation pandemic, but outcomes from an online learning weren't so great. They were terrible. What did we do wrong? How can machine learning, AI, and learn LA help? Learning and analytics help. Yes, it's a good question. Uh, and, and it is fact that uh, online, but the, the, this is the purpose of this presentation is to tell about that AI can play a role in it, but student, but uh, the development needs this kind of tools. This kind of implementation is required uh, uh, for students that uh, they could follow them. So, uh, but students, uh, but in uh, different online courses, because that was the pandemic time, and uh, obviously, uh, every everyone was in that condition. So. Uh, th that's why maybe uh, different people could not use the tool. So uh, that's why we prefer that you go towards the, the, the tools development and uh, it will be useful for them. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Pim. Uh, so we'll take a small break here to chat on your, your favorite mind. MOOCs or what you need. And then Alan will come and talk about dancing. So hopefully everyone loves that. Dancing. Five minutes? Five minutes, yeah. Or as long as you can go.
Sí. <risa> Welcome back, Internet, and welcome back. Uh, we'll have Alan now talk about dancing and machine learning. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. you. Oh, you have a mic. You have a mic. Yeah, I have Good. a mic, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, um, thanks very much thanks for turning up this evening. It's my first time at the uh, machine learning, learning user learning group. User group. Probably, probably my first time, my first time ever, ever at a not Microsoft, Microsoft, Microsoft user group. Uh, I've really, I've been, really involved been involved a lot with the Microsoft community, community previously. previously. Uh, uh, but I think, I think I've, I've been, been attending, attending various user group meetings since about 2004, a long, a long time. So a bit about myself, um, I describe myself as a developer, trainer, mentor, uh, and evangelist. I love working with new technologies and um, usually at looking at kind of the next big thing. So when I was working at a shop where everybody's working in C, uh, I was uh, the guy who was working with Java. And then at a Java shop, I was the guy who was doing .NET. And then at a .NET shop, I was uh, the guy who was learning stuff about Azure. Now I'm at an Azure shop uh, and I'm doing lots of stuff with the Microsoft AI technologies because uh, we feel uh, that we're gonna get uh, a lot more interest in uh, projects from customers. And there's some great technologies and really rapid uh, evolution. So I like to work in that space where things are changing very rapidly and uh, we're getting lots of new, uh, new technologies uh, to start uh, looking at. I've been uh, an Azure MVP um, for a number of years. I started out in 2005 as being a BizTalk MVP. Um, we have an ex MVP, Hank used to be an MVP for uh, machine learning, wasn't it? Yeah. And this is uh, an award that Microsoft gives to people who put a lot of energy into the, uh, into the community. So I met up with, uh, with Hank when we were involved with the Global AI uh, Bootcamp, and I was working with, with a hands-on uh, lab for that. That I might mention a bit, uh, a bit about uh, later on. I'm also, uh, together with Hank, uh, organizing conferences. Um, we ran the first ever AI Burst conference in Stockholm uh, a few years ago. It was a glorious uh, sunny day, and um, Hank and, was it Wilhelm, uh, came over uh, from the Netherlands, and we had a few Swedish speakers. We had a great, like, um, single day uh, event and it's basically a free uh, free to attend uh, these these events paid for by sponsorships and then we planned a second ai burst and then covid happened so we've kind of been on pause uh, for uh, for a couple of years we've now got a date uh, it's sometime towards the end of august i think and we're, we're running uh, one day here in stockholm and one day in in amsterdam it's going to be the same speaker lineup at both at both events but um hopefully uh, we're going to get a room full of people and some good speakers and it's going to be a great day it's also going to be a free uh, event uh, to to uh, attend if you want to follow me on youtube um there's uh, my youtube link there i'll probably mention it at the end as well so a bit about the presentation i was working with uh, ai and machine learning and um stumbling around all of the, the videos you get in feeds on YouTube. And this video popped up and it just really impressed me um, how um, they basically built this um, neural network or trained a neural network where you could take a source video of a professional dancer. Uh, you could detect the pose using a, an algorithm uh, to be able to bring out the pose. So this is a bit like um, a uh, neural network doing the same thing as a connect sensor would do, detecting the body pose from the actual body positions. Then you can use that detected pose to be able to take a, a not professional dancer and get the not professional dancer to follow the moves of the uh, professional dancer. And it just blew me away. I was thinking, yeah, how the heck do they do that? You know, what makes this work? So I started looking in and investigating and uh, thinking, well, this is done by people at MIT. I can't do this. I can't get this code to work. It's going to be really complex. It's going to require lots of expensive hardware to be able to get this, this thing uh, running. So a bit about um, how things work. This is um, a service called the Azure Computer Vision, uh, which is one of the Azure Cognitive Services. And what you can do with this Computer Vision service is you can basically feed in an image and you're going to come up with a, a text description of that image. It provides things like face detection, object detection, all kinds of other things. But it will also produce a sentence, uh, which is a caption uh, for that image. So if you've got a big image library at your company, you can uh, run all the, these images through the computer vision service. You can generate all your tags. You can then uh, you know, search on this, and you can also generate captions uh, for these, uh, these images. So what generative AI will do, and another really impressive example of that is the DALI uh, project, is instead of um, putting in an image, you put in a sentence. And from that sentence, uh, it can actually generate an image from that particular sentence. So an illustration of a baby duck on radish in a tutu flying a kite, and it will generate these various images uh, based on that. I don't know if I've got the actual uh, link in here, if I need to Google uh, for this, uh, see if I can find it. And you can basically go in and, and look at this. It's um, 
currently running as a website. It hasn't, um, as far as I know, got the free text option to be able to type in uh, free text, but uh, you can actually um, select various chunks uh, of the actual sentence here. So you can change this to uh, an avocado um, in a cape, flying a kite, and it will come up with all of these, these images. And these are actually generated uh, with, with neural networks from those particular uh, sentences. So um, exploring generative AI and getting to learn a bit about how generative AI works. There's other examples uh, that you can, you can look at as well. Pix to Pix is what the uh, Everybody Dance Now uh, project has been uh, based on. And Pix to Pix is able to take kind of a simplified image and be able to generate a more complex uh, image uh, from that. So normally with AI, we do something called dimensionality uh, reduction. Uh, we're feeding in something with, with lots of features, lots of dimensions, and we're coming out with something simpler uh, that's coming out of the network. And the networks are usually going down with lots of inputs and coming down to a few, uh, a few outputs. The Pix to Pix is able to take in um, you know, the, uh, the actual images and be able to generate these, these images of buildings. It's been used a lot in, in various um, scenarios, such as uh, with mapping data, to be able to take in, say, um, uh, go to Google Maps and you've got the, the actual mapping data and you've also got aerial photos. So they're able to actually um, synthesize aerial photos from uh, map data. It's been done a lot in games. I think the Microsoft Flight Simulator was using mapping data to actually generate real world images, um, you know, based on those types of, of uh, technologies. You can also play around with this, uh, this technology. Um, here we can uh, basically do something with cats. So what they're doing here is um, starting with a line drawing of a cat and actually generating an image uh, of a cat. And uh, that's basically going to run that particular model. It runs pretty slow on my laptop, but hopefully it's, gonna, it's not going to take too long. And then uh, you can basically um, work with your own images. And um, one of these here, you can see it's only got one eye, so I can maybe draw in the other eye and uh, click on process and see if it's going to generate a, a second eye on that, that cat. <laughs> sort of, <laughs> yeah. And um, some of these are more impressive than others. I quite like the building one. Um, so if we clear this, if I do process, it's going to download the model. And then you can select the various things uh, to place in this building. So I can take a door. I can draw a door. And then uh, a window. I can draw a few windows. This is about the limits of my drawing skills. And then you can put in some columns. And it generates uh, the building uh, from that particular image. Again, uh, we're increasing uh, the, the complexity here of those, uh, those various uh, images. So uh, going back to this, um, back to the actual deck and looking at how the Everybody Dance Now uh, stuff works. What we're doing here is taking this actual pose image and the actual network uh, that we're going to be training is going to be taken in this actual uh, pose data. And what we're going to do is pass that through uh, the uh, generative uh, network and it's actually going to generate uh, a picture of a person in the particular position that we've got uh, from that pose. Now this is doing it for a single frame. So if you want to do it for an animation, all we've got to do is to take a video of a professional dancer, in this case uh, Bruno Mars, and then basically split that video into all of the actual uh, sub-images and run that through open pose to be able to generate a sequence uh, of poses. And then what you can then do is use the uh, model to be able to generate a sequence of uh, images and then compose those back into a video and be able to actually play the video. I can show you the actual uh, results of that, uh, that a, bit, uh, a bit later on. So if you do want to experiment with this, uh, the code is available on GitHub. So you can basically go in and you can download this source code. I've pretty much made um, virtually no changes to the actual source code to actually run it on my machine at home and to be able to get it running in uh, Azure ML as well, the Azure Machine Learning. So I did need to learn a bit about what generative AI is. Uh, there's a really great book up on, on there, Hands-On uh, Generative Adversarial Networks uh, with, with PyTorch. Um, most of the samples, I think, Pix to Pix is running on PyTorch, and Everybody Dance Now is running on PyTorch. So it helps if you've got a bit of a PyTorch basics. Also, uh, I decided to use a green screen for the background, so I bought a really big uh, green screen as well. Uh, set this uh, stuff up in my living room uh, to be able to do the actual uh, recordings there. And 
When I was recording it, I was actually using, um, you know, if you've got uh, any kind of a new uh, mobile phone, it's going to shoot at 60 or 120 frames a second. This means that you get a lot of training data uh, in a relatively uh, short uh, number of, number of uh, times. So I basically shot in quite high resolution at 120 frames a second to actually produce uh, the, the actual uh, source video. I tested it this with, with my son first. He was the first volunteer uh, that we, we used, uh, used for that to be able to generate the images. And then uh, again, we use open pose to be able to generate uh, the actual uh, pose uh, pictures uh, like that. Then it comes on to training the model, uh, which is time consuming. Um, roughly it took about five days uh, when I was training at home uh, on my home PC. This wasn't popular with the family. Uh, basically you could tell when a training run had finished because it went quiet in the apartment. And um, the thing was running con constantly 24 seven. Uh, my machine is upstairs in the living room. You can hear it downstairs in the bedroom uh, at, at night. So it, it is uh, noisy. I'm planning my conference schedule to be out of the country when the electricity bill arrives because you do need to run quite a hefty GPU 24-7 and that, and that takes a lot of power. Alternatively, you can run it in as RML and uh, basically uh, save yourself uh, the money uh, doing that. Okay, so... Um, Creating the actual target data, again, we're taking a professional dance, so we're using the open pose to be able to generate the target poses uh, for that. Hopefully, I can show you a bit about how this, uh, this works. Um, so I do have, I was actually running everything on my machine at home, but I've dragged in the actual, uh, some of the actual uh, data sets here. So I basically started out with uh, a video, and this is the actual raw video that I was using. I don't know if this is going to open, actually. Um, open with VLC. So this is basically um, what I shot myself, doing an approximation of, of Bruno Mars uh, dancing to be able to generate that data uh, with, with a green screen. What we then do is uh, use about three or four lines of Python and OpenCV to actually split that into the individual uh, frames. And because I was shooting at um, 120 frames a second, I got about 22,000 frames out of a three minute uh, video. Then uh, we can use open pose. So hopefully I should be able to demo uh, how that works. It will be incredibly slow uh, on this machine because uh, it really benefits from having a good, a good GPU. But uh, I think I've got the command line there for the, the open pose to be able to do that. And uh, what this will do is basically take the source video and generate the, uh, the pose uh, videos for that. I think for some reason it's not running on, uh, on the GPU on, on this laptop. Uh, I've not really figured out how to get that, that connected. But I think it's taken about 20 seconds per frame uh, to be able to generate it on this box. Uh, back home it's doing about one frame a second, which is, um, which is okay. You can tweak around with the command line options so you can reduce the quality and in, you can increase the quality. Also uh, with open pose, I'm actually doing uh, hand detection. Um, which is going to take a, a bit more processing time. I've got the option to generate the hands as well. You can actually generate the face, which will generate uh, the, ma the mouth and, and stuff like that. And what that's going to do, as you can see here, is it's basically doing the same thing as a Kinect uh, sensor will do. If you've ever played around with it with Kinect, uh, you can actually get Kinect to be able to generate this data using a 3D camera, but we're just getting this from the actual uh, 2D image. Now, it's not actually saving out the images itself. What it's actually saving out is um, the pose data, uh, which is uh, in these key point files coming out as JSON data. I think I can drop one of these into Visual Studio and, and show you what this thing looks like. So this is basically a JSON file and um, it detects uh, a number of people within that video and then it's giving you the actual points here. Um, so for each point, I think there's 25 points, you've got the X, Y coordinates in pixels and then you've got the um, uh, confidence uh, that that is the particular point. And it generates this for the body and then it also generates this. Uh, I haven't generated any face key points here, but you've got the hand left and hand right uh, there. The next stage is to actually generate the training data, uh, which is going to be a combination of the input frames and the post data. And that is uh, basically going to generate the um, output data. And this is uh, this graph train, which I think I've got set up as the actual startup project. So if I run this, what it's going to do is to run through the frames, basically taking in the pose data and generating uh, the actual uh, outbound uh, files. And what this will do is if you go into the train, it will basically generate the, uh, the training set. So you can see that we've got the training images, uh, which are coming out here, and we've got the training labels, uh, which is coming out here. Uh, these actual uh, files are being uh, generated here. And this is gonna be the input to the neural network. 
It's basically going to say, based on this particular input on frame 73, uh, the required output is going to be, if we go down to frame 73 here, this particular uh, pose. Then we're going to be training a, a um, generative adversarial uh, network, which is the same technique as used in pix to pix to be able to take those actual stick figure images and to be able to generate the actual images of the, uh, the person. Okay, so if I drop back to the slides again. So once we generate the target data, we're going to generate the target poses. So this is going to be Bruno Mars uh, and all of the positions that Bruno Mars makes. And in theory, if we feed in these target poses into the neural network, then we'll get an animation of uh, me dancing like uh, Bruno Mars. Uh, that's the theory anyway. Um, so for the transfer, we're taking the target poses, as I mentioned, sending them into the neural network, and that's uh, generating the actual images. The reason I've done it on a green screen is um, I use Camtasia a lot. I record uh, for YouTube. I record courses for Pluralsight. Um, so I'm pretty much a black belt with using Camtasia. Uh, I usually spend weeks uh, sat in front of it when I'm working with, uh, with Pluralsight stuff. And uh, it's very easy in Camtasia to just to take out the actual background and uh, remove the, the green screen effects. Um, the GAN network is uh, basically um, two networks that you're training. One of them is going to be generating the output and the other one is going to be uh, telling how good the output is and giving it a measure of quality. And both of these networks uh, are basically trained together in this training process and that's why it gets the name of uh, an adversarial uh, network. So the first epoch when you run through uh, your output looks something like this and as you're running through an additional outputs um, the, um, the You've got the generator, and then you've got the discriminator that's going to compare the actual output with, with what's come out of the network and basically give it a score. And the idea is that we're going to Im be improving the score of this, and the generator is going to get better at generating images. Also, the discriminator is going to get better at being able to uh, discriminate the real from the fake uh, data. And as you run through the epochs, you'll actually see uh, the quality of the image uh, improving uh, as it actually uh, does start to uh, get running on, on the, uh, the training data. So one thing that they do in the Everybody Dance now is they uh, deal with temporal coherence, which is basically um, making sure that uh, you get a more smooth or fluid uh, movement uh, in the actual dancing. If you just do this with single images, uh, you're basically feeding in a bunch of sing uh, single frames, you're getting out at a bunch of single frames, and there's nothing kind of linking those together. Dance is about movement, uh, the fact that you're moving between one position and another position. So what the uh, Everybody Dance Now was doing was taking the uh, previous frame and the next frame and being able to actually um, you know, use both of those as an actual comparison. So it's really tracking the movement or the difference between two frames, uh, looking at the deltas there, to be able to generate more smooth movements. I don't know if this has affected my results because the Bruno Mars video was at uh, like 25 frames a second and I'm at 120 frames a second. So maybe uh, the temporal coherence hasn't worked too well in that particular, uh, that particular uh, scenario. So um, when it gets to actually training the network, um, you've got this unfeasibly long command line that we're going to be uh, using, which is something like this. So I'm running uh, trainfull.py, uh, uh, which is part of the Everybody Dance. Now I'm entering the name of the model, the data set, uh, the checkpoints directory, and various um, configurations for the actual uh, network. And there's actually two training processes. We're doing a train local and we're doing a train global as well. So what this is doing is spinning up the network, um, creating the output directory. And then it throws an exception uh, because we've got CUDA out of memory. These networks are big. They are really big. So um, I think it takes about 12 gig of GPU RAM uh, to be able to actually load up the model and start training it. That's quite a lot. This um, little old laptop that I have has about 4 gig of uh, GPU RAM. Now that's going to be a roadblock if you don't have enough GPU memory to be able to load up the model. You're not going to get very far with being able to train it. This is where Azure Machine Learning comes in uh, because you've got a, a good, great choice of being able to choose different uh, machines with, with different uh, GPUs. So if you're not able to run it on your local machine, uh, what you can do is push it into Azure Machine Learning. So I've got a machine learning uh, workspace here. If I go to um, this um, thing here, this is uh, basically a resource I have created. I can go into something called the Machine Learning Studio and I can go to the compute environments. And I've got these various compute clusters here in different uh, regions. 
One thing I've found is that the price of these can vary when you're going into different regions. So this one here, I've provisioned in West US. Two good things about that. Firstly, um, it was actually cheaper on a per hour price to run it in West US. Secondly, uh, when I'm working, uh, when we were working in Europe, uh, people in West US are usually asleep. And one thing that you can do when you create these compute clusters is you can take advantage of low priority machines. This is like using resources in the Azor regions that are not being at use. So if there's low demands on a region, it's going to be less expensive to use that. So if I go for dedicated, you can see that um, if I go on to a GPU machine, you can see that this machine is costing $1.17 an hour. If I go on to low priority, it drops to $0.23 cents an hour. I've also got the option of using a Tesla V100 machine at $0.76 cents an hour. So that's three times the hourly price, but um, in terms of cost for running a job, it's going to be cheaper uh, to run it on the more expensive uh, machine there. Um, one thing you do have to be aware of is eviction. Um, if you're running this uh, for days and days and days on a low priority machine, somebody else may have a higher priority than you and you might get, might get your machine taken away from you. You'll get it back eventually, uh, but you do want to build code where you can resume training uh, if something goes wrong with, uh, with your model and you need to restart the experiment and continue from the uh, that last uh, training point at where you left off. So um, the code to throw this into Azure ML uh, is not too complex. So this is everybody uh, dance now master. I've pretty much dragged that down from GitHub and made um, very, very few uh, changes to it. And this is uh, the code that I'm using to push it into Azure Machine Learning. So if I just zoom in on this, what I'm doing is uh, connecting using a configuration to connect to Azure ML. And that uh, JSON configuration file has the details about uh, you know, where my Azure machine learning uh, workspace is uh, located. I then generate an environment, and this is called dance environment, and it's coming from dancedependencies.yaml. I don't work with YAML, um, but I've heard lots of people talking about um, YAML, and I think I've got my YAML file here. Didn't include it in the project, but this is this is it. So what we're doing here is describing that we're going to be running on Python 3.7. Uh, we're talking about the various versions of PyTorch that we've got to use and the various other Python libraries. This is going to be used by Azure ML to prepare the actual environment so we can actually run uh, the, the uh, Python code in there. So that basically um, prepares that environment for us. What we're then doing is um, basically specifying the base image. So here we want to use an image uh, that is going to support the GPU. So I'm selecting this image has got uh, CUDA 10.1 installed. It's running on Ubuntu 18.04 and that's going to basically select the uh, the base image. I'm then selecting the, the compute cluster that I'm using here. I'm using the Tesla K80 on low priority and uh, that's going to be the name of the environment. We then need to get the data into uh, Microsoft Azure. And another great thing about machine learning uh, in Azure is it supports all of the actual uh, data sets. So uh, I think I'll leave that page there. I can go into the um, data sets in this environment here. And you can see that I've got various uh, data sets that I've been uh, using uh, for Everybody Dance now. So this is uh, the one that I was using for um, one of the experiments that I did. And that should show us all of the files and all of the images that we've got. Fairly slow internet connection, but you can see basically see all of the, the ping files that I've got in this particular environment here. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're working with image-based or text-based uh, data sets. It's fairly easy to load this stuff up, and it's just stored in, in a service called Blob Storage uh, within, uh, within uh, Microsoft Azure. So that's basically how I'm managing all of my data. So what I need to do is to point um, the... Um, experiment at that particular data set. So I'm basically getting this Everybody Dance Now Bruno top and setting that as the data set. Now when we're working with these data sets, the data set is in a service called Blob Storage, but Python doesn't know anything about Blob Storage. It's expecting uh, a folder full of files. So what we're doing is we're basically uh, setting uh, the data root to this data set as named input target data set as mount, which will basically mount all of the data in blob storage onto the actual file system of the virtual machine that's going to be uh, running this experiment. I'm then uh, mentioning, uh, as um, I had in 
this command line, all of the various command line options. So I've got the load size, label NC, uh, number of iterations and number of decayed iterations, which is basically specified uh, here in this scenario. This was just a test run, so I was only really doing one epoch and then one epoch where we actually delay the, uh, the learning rate and then we specify the output directory. Okay, so oh, I think that's the wrong thing that I'm running here. What I'll need to do is to select this as the actual startup project. Okay, let's try that again. And what I can do is run this. What this is going to do is basically take uh, the code that I've got in the Everybody Dance now. Um, I'm pointing at that actual repository. I didn't show you that actually. Um, yeah, this is going to be the source directory, Everybody Dance Now Master, and then the actual Python script that we're running is going to be trainfullts.py, uh, 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 the, the Python file. So by running that, it's just basically going to push that code into uh, machine learning. Okay, so that seems to have worked uh, satisfactory. If I go back to my Azure ML workspace, I should be able to go into experiments and uh, see that we've got a new experiment. Now, this one is currently running, uh, I think, if I look at my compute pool, um, yeah, I've set the maximum number of nodes here to one, and I'm currently running one experiment. So what I can do is actually cancel this experiment run, and I can just do cancel on that. And what that should do is basically because that one's been cancelled, it's then going to uh, actually start running the experiment I've just uploaded. So if I go back to experiments, uh, it should actually change state on this one. You can see that this one is running. So they come out with all these strange words. Sometimes you get a cool word like mighty dinner. Sometimes you get something like sad pot or something like that. Um, I'm not sure. They just basically generate these with these random verbs and nouns. So this experiment does seem to be running. We can go into the outputs and logs and basically see, uh, see what's happening uh, in this particular experiment uh, run here. So we'll basically uh, run through and um, give you uh, all of the details on how the experiment is running. Um, if I look at the previous one, we can maybe see some of the outputs. Um, and this one here probably got a bit further in its processing. So if I go to the outputs, um, into web and into the images folder. So this is showing the input labels and then we've got the real images. And then we should have at the bottom some synthesized images there. So you can see this is coming from, um, I think it's saving it every 100 iterations or something like that if we, as we go down these synthesized images. As we, as we sort of scroll down, the quality gets uh, better and better and better as, as it actually uh, runs through. So you can basically uh, go through and basically analyze and see how the uh, experiment uh, is running uh, once it's running in uh, Azure ML. Okay, so I'll drop back to the slides a bit, a bit, bit about the background of Azure, Azure ML. We work with our data sets, so we can generate a data store. We can use various resources for that. We can load up, you know, tabular data, uh, files, images, and so on, and use that for the, the data set management. It also supports features for being able to do, uh, if you're working with, say, object detection, and you've got to, um, you know, upload 10,000 images and draw bounding boxes on them, it will uh, be able to, um, you know, divide that in. So a various, uh, you know, you can have a team of people going in and training and putting labels on the various projects. It's supports all of, all of the things like that, provides the computing capabilities. It also provides uh, other mechanisms for being able to work with. So you can work with uh, notebooks. Uh, you've also got the Azure uh, Automated ML, uh, which will basically um, take um, typically tabular data and run loads of different models on that and basically figure out what the best uh, model is. You can uh, run experiments, you can do more complex things with pipelines, you can export the models and publish uh, the models. So it provides a lot of functionality for being able to uh, run and manage uh, machine learning uh, projects. Uh, I think I've been through some of these uh, these actual uh, slides uh, in the actual, the actual uh, code there. So a bit about the, um, the cards that are running. You've got like an NVIDIA Tesla K80, uh, which is the one that I was running on. Uh, you've also got the uh, V100 uh, if you want to spin up one of those. That was costing about 76 cents an hour or something like that to get that kind of a, of a, of a processing power on the low uh, priority. If you want to do this at home, um, I mentioned the, you know, the requirement for having a lot of GPU memory. So running on an RTX 3090 uh, is probably the best. That gives you 24 gig of uh, GP at RAM. You could probably get away with it with a 3060. Uh, you could maybe load the models on that. However, the 3090 has uh, the 10,000 uh, CUDA cores. So it is incredibly fast at being able to train those models. 
Um, I put this deck together. I don't know if you can actually buy an RTX 3090 these days or if they're still uh, still sold out. But uh, the way I got hold of one, uh, I actually put in a request for one of these. Um, they were a bit suspicious uh, at a consultancy company where I put in a request for a $4,000. And this is exclusive of Mom's gaming desktop PC. And they're saying, Alan, why do you need a gaming desktop PC? And it's, it's not the gaming desktop, it's just the 3090 that's in it uh, that you can't buy for love or money anywhere else. But they do actually ship them uh, in these, uh, these alien uh, wear uh, PCs. Um, yeah, you, you can go big if you want um, to buy sort of really big data science uh, workstations. They cost a lot of, uh, a lot of money. Um, also, hard drive space is going to be an issue. Uh, that was basically the um, data sets I was working with, 152 gigabytes and then half a million files. And this was all of the image files and various things I was creating uh, for a number of um, uh, different uh, data sets. Okay, unfortunately, I can't demo the training of the model because the GPU won't actually load the model itself. I do have uh, a couple of sample videos I can uh, show you. So um, the first one I did was, um, if I go into AI data, into demo videos. I'm kind of worried about copyright. Last time, I think Erica, remember, I showed this F1 logo detection, uh, which is basically using uh, object detection to detect the amount of time in seconds that people get with coverage of their advertisements in Formula One. Unfortunately, uh, we got caught out by Goo, um, YouTube's AI, which detected content from FormulaOne.com and immediately blocked uh, the actual uh, video there. So um, we got let's caught out. No, <laughs> let's not do that again. Let's try one more time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the first one I did was with my son James. Um, I think it needs to need to play it in um, open with a VLC. Yeah, that's going to be better. And you can see the target, and there's a source on the target there. So there should be music on this. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it kind of came out okay most of the time. Um, one thing that you really need to get is, is a constant background uh, to be able to um, get it to actually work with the quality of the images. Any type of moving background, if the camera is moving, it's, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, and this Bruno Mars video it was really nice because on the actual um, target, uh, when we're taking the videos from Bruno, he's, it's basically a fixed camera in a fixed position. It's always the same angle on his, his body, or it's usually the same angle. There are a couple of bits where it does actually change. And I actually cut out what was happening when it was generating those uh, videos from a different camera angle. But the one I generated with myself, um, oh, I need to use VLC, I keep forgetting that. It worked pretty much, I'm not getting as good results as they were getting at MIT. I think um, another thing is about the, the scaling of that. I'll explain a bit about that, a bit about that later on. But as soon as the actual um, position changes, you get some really weird results when the camera angle changes. Um, see if I can find those. Yeah. You can see there when it gets on to um, that position there, there's no actual source data with me uh, in that particular position because it was always taken from that same camera angle. So it's really um, having a hard time, you know, generating anything meaningful uh, from that particular uh, position. But it's kind of sort of okay in uh, in most of the actual um, uh, positions when it's generating. Another thing is the actual dance moves that you use um, should be fairly similar uh, to the actual uh, dance moves that the professional dancer is using. So you've got the body within the right uh, position. I'll try and um, illustrate that if I can go back to the Everybody Dance Now project. <coughs> oh, it's probably going to be in, in YouTube, actually. Um, There's one thing that I noticed that they were doing, they were um, basically following a lot of the ideas I tried to, uh, to replicate. You can see that their results uh, are a, a lot better than mine. I don't know if they've been running it for, uh, for a lot longer. I, the model that I trained with myself had to be done fairly quickly uh, in order to uh, get it ready for this, uh, this, uh, this presentation. And, but uh, if we go into the other examples,
you see that they used uh, Bruno Mars as the source subject and then um, tried to have kind of fairly similar moves in the uh, destination ones to be able to get the actual, the actual mapping there. In this one, they're actually getting the reflection on the window, uh, which I thought was, it was pretty impressive uh, there. And uh, there's another one with, uh, with ballet dancing, which was, was my favourite. See if I can find that one. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the source uh, subject. And uh, there you can see they're making ballet dancer-ish <laughs> moves. And uh, the results that came out there, I thought, were, were pretty, uh, pretty good there. With... Uh, with that one. So I mean takeaways on this, um, if you see something that somebody has done at MIT and you think wow that's just too impressive I'll never be able to do stuff like that, you know try downloading the code. Most of um, the examples are available on GitHub, you can download it and you can you can get it to work. It's not too uh, too uh, ch uh, challenging. The mo most of the challenge was just understanding uh, the language that they were using. I'm kind of new to AI, uh, fairly new to PyTorch when I started this project. So when they were just mentioning very briefly how the actual um, code works, how we can actually train the, uh, the model. I think we've got the code on GitHub. Uh, yeah. They were just talking about the instructions for training the local stage, training the, go the, um, uh, the global stage, and then how to test it. There's not really that much uh, description there on how to generate the actual data. So it did take me a while to figure out uh, what's, uh, what's going on. Um, whether you run it on-premise or whether you run it in Azure ML, uh, that's, uh, that's really up to you. Uh, if your boss is going to buy you a very big machine uh, with a big GPU on it um, to either carry around or uh, to be able to have at home, uh, then you can uh, you know, consider running it uh, on your local uh, machine. In honest opinion, I'd say you need both. Um, before I got um, uh, that machine, it was really hard to run stuff uh, with only using the Azure machine learning because you'd basically run your experiment. It would take five minutes for the experiment to run up. And then you'd basically use a single equals instead of a double equals somewhere in your Python code, and it just throws back an error. So you fix the error and do a deploy, and then another five minutes for the, uh, the actual uh, experiment to spin up. It's, it's nicer to be able to just run it um, all of the time uh, locally on your, your uh, local PC. The advantage of using Azure ML uh, is that you don't have to have your uh, machine running 24-7 uh, to be able to actually train the model. You can just push it up into the cloud and have it running somewhere else, which is going to save you a lot in electricity. It's also going to give you a lot of uh, peace and quiet at home and also the tracking uh, of all of the models and all of the experiments instead of just having a bunch of files on your hard drive you actually get um, you know all of the statistics about how the model has been trained all of the various uh, files as well and for a team of people uh, working on an ml project it's really good to consider uh, and take a look at using the the azure ml uh, technologies i'd say this was the simplest part uh, you know i thought it would be fairly challenging to get this code running in the cloud but it was it was very straightforward and i've done it this with other models as well training um, you know, image classification, object detection, very easy uh, to just, just throw it up into Azure and get things that run there. Okay, so I think my time's up. Um, happy to take any questions uh, before we move into the panel discussion. Cool, thanks, Alan. Um, I'm just going to set this up and we'll switch to the panel quickly. Do you want these chairs for the panel? Do you have a question there? Come on. You, you question I, I can see you, you, you have a question, but you're afraid to ask me. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Here you go. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for nice presentation. Thanks. Uh, I want to know that uh, which language you used for your computer vision. Is it Python or like uh, JavaScript or? Um, yeah, Python. Um, okay. to actually uh, work with the code in, in Azure ML. Uh, Microsoft has taken big investments in, in Python. That's something that maybe uh, Hank can give, uh, give more on, on, the, on the background of. Um, but I did start off with learning something called ML.NET, uh, which is a .NET machine learning library. Uh, I didn't, to be honest, get too far with it. Uh, very quickly I discovered that if you want to work with AI and machine learning, then Python is, is really the way to go. And uh, so Microsoft is doing so much for Python developers now with the Azure ML, all of the examples are in Python. So it's pretty much a language I, I try and work with most of the time nowadays. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have another question. How did you come across this project in the first place? The? How did you come across this project? Uh, oh, that's Google's AI. Place? Uh, it just recommends videos that you might be interested in. It just popped up on, um, you know, on, on the front page of, of YouTube, um, mm -hmm. and I just clicked on it and thought, wow, this is, this is really cool. 
Yeah, because when you show the first shot, it's like, okay, do they have some sensors that guide them up to that? Uh, just the first little clip that you show in the first... No, to, to actually do the pose detection, they're using something called open pose. Mm. So I'm assuming yeah. what they've done is they've trained a network using um, like a bunch of images. And then if you've got like uh, the Xbox Connect <coughs> controller, yeah. that basically generates a 3D skeleton uh, with all of the actual permissions. So by training a network to be able to generate the 3D skeleton from the actual individual poses from the photos, that can basically run. I wish I could show it on my machine, but it's just so slow. Uh, it will take in an image and it just uh, generates the skeleton data for all of the people within that image. All right, cool. Well, thanks. Can you tell me where you... Oh, excuse me. I want to ask you uh, some. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. But I, I just want to know when you're starting the, the program, the project, do you have challenge, something like you have prepared something like uh, knowledge, something like before you make it? So sorry, when I... Yo, <coughs> no, yo, before you're starting this project, do you have something like prepare something, have challenge, something like that, have knowledge before that? No, I, I just did it for fun. Um, I wanted to learn more about um, Azure ML. Uh, I wanted to just basically learn more about the generative AI. Okay. So I tend to have a lot of hobby projects where I just basically want to explore certain certain things with AI and I just thought it would be a fun thing to look at. Okay. For how long you can uh, finish it, the project, something like that? For example, uh, dancing. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know where it's going to go. It's, uh, it, I think it's fun to show to people um, as, as an example of AI and then I think seeing something really complex um, and then being able to provide a bit of an explanation of how that, how that works and what, what actually goes inside. I really love to understand you know, how they can do that. And I think just my curiosity for understanding how that um, solution works and then helping people to, uh, other people to understand how that works is, uh, is, is, is useful. Okay. Do you have something uh, special tools when you make it this project? No, I'm just using uh, using Python code, okay. uh, running it in Visual Studio. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Alan. Any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Three minute break. Three minute break. Please don't leave. Come back.
Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of the A Bit of AI Show. Uh, the A Bit of AI Show is all about the people behind the AI systems. What do they do? How did they get to this point in their career? And we're going to kind of find out what they do actually when they're sitting behind their computer. So my name is Henk Boerman and I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft. And today I'm very excited that I will have three guests. So we have Aisha, Corey and Alan joining me today. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, we will start with a quick round of introductions. So I'll start with you. Can you tell me who you are and what you do in your daily life? Um, I'm Aisha. I'm a researcher at Stockholm University Department of Computer and System Sciences. So I mostly my focus is on my work. Uh, I'm also developing tools. Uh, I'm a software developer, so work on it and uh, do research, study papers, study literature, find out limitations, work on it. So this is my work. Cool, so what, was your what is your latest research on? Yeah, my re latest research is on explainable AI and uh, uh, I gave demo about that. So uh, it was and uh, developed a tool for uh, student self-regulation. So it was, uh, it was uh, published in uh, last year, October. Amazing. We will share the link in the comments to that, uh, yeah. to that research. Yeah. Corey, thank you so much for joining me. Can you also quickly oh, introduce yourself? Thank you for coming <laughs> to the reactor. Um, yeah, my name is Corey. I am an AI cloud advocate here at Microsoft. So I'm like Hank, but I don't travel the world. I don't have a cool show, but I do have this great space uh, here uh, for hosting events and engaging the Stockholm community, which are behind the camera that you can't see, but they're lovely people. So can you tell me what, um, you did, what the last thing you did for work? The last thing maybe, I did? Maybe not today. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last thing I did uh, for work, I uh, had a... Um, it's starting your AI builder's journey workshop here in this reactor where I was trying to help people navigate the world of all the different AI tools and platforms are out there. It can be overwhelming if you're just starting out. Um, <clears throat> so it's just kind of helping them navigate the journey, what tools to choose and how to choose them basically. Excellent. And we can always, uh, is that also online available? It is YouTube reactor. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ellen. Can you introduce yourself and tell me um, what you do in your daily work? Yeah, Alan Smith from uh, from the north of England. I've been in Sweden since about '98, I think. Um, so, long time um, resident in in Stockholm. And um, we'll, I work at a company. We do lots of projects. Uh, most of our projects are focused on the Microsoft Azure platform. So, we've been looking at uh, opportunities for the customers to uh, start working with uh, with the AI technologies. Um, lots of interesting cognitive services and the auto ML stuff. Um, we're also looking for customers who are interested in more in, in custom vision. That's really my thing. I like working with uh, custom vision and images and, uh, and stuff like that. So it's, it's good to look at those types of uh, technologies. I also do a lot with training. Uh, I've just finished updating one of my Pluralsight courses and I've been, uh, I think I've got another two or three uh, uh, classroom courses uh, before the summer break. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I learned a lot from your, uh, from your Pluralsight uh, courses because I am also uh, started out as a developer in this space and starting to learn. So your courses were really helpful for, uh, for me. Yeah, thanks. So I'm wondering, today you went to work, or maybe you had a day off, but I assume you went to work. So what did you do? I was actually on this thing called WAB today. Uh, my son was ill. I don't know how it is uh, where you are, but in Sweden, um, you can basically uh, stay at home with your kids when they're not well and at school. So. I was playing Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2 with my son for <laughs> quite a lot of the day. But what I should have been doing uh, is, is preparing for the conferences. Um, this session that I've done, I think I've got another three uh, conference presentations before the summer. I've got one for, um, I think I've got one or two for Tukarama, and then I've got one for IglaConf as well uh, coming up, which I'm looking forward to. What is it about? What are the sessions uh, they're about? They're all AI ones. So I'm doing uh, one, uh, another one on this Everybody Dance Now uh, that I've done previously. Um, and then I've got another one which is f fairly similar. It's talking about neural networks from 0.0, .0 to Dancer, um, where I basically go through explaining what a neuron is on the first slide and then finishing off with talking about how the uh, generative AI works. Um, but then going through 
a lot of looking about how confnets work with images and uh, network design and uh, various things that you can do and can't do uh, with, with neural networks. Oh, that's going to be interesting. Mm, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, yeah. So, in the bit of AI show, we have something that is called a lightning round. And that is kind of something to get to know all of you a little bit better and get some secrets out of you that I don't dare to kind of ask directly. <laughs> so let's start with Ellen and then move to, uh, to here. And um, we start with you. Oh, yeah. Okay, so first question, what was your first computer? It was a ZX81, 1K of RAM Z80 processor, then graduated to a VIC-20 that had 3.5K of RAM. Amazing. Yeah, didn't fa fit that, uh, that model you just demoed. No. No. <laughs> Corey? <clears throat> I know I'm going to lose my developer card or techie card because uh, I do not remember the exact specs of my first computer. <laughs> I know it was an IBM. Uh, I remember the, just using the command line. Uh, my dad brought it from work, and yeah, it's been using computers ever since. But yeah, sadly, don't remember the specs. Yeah, same case with me. I I'm not exactly remember that, but it was an old computer. My brother mm. used it, and <laughs> and just they gave me. A, okay, I have bought a new one, and you take it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that that happens for me too with my uh, with one of my dad. Um, do you remember which operating system was running on? Because that kind of sketches the age. No, uh, it was Windows, uh, Windows, but its version was like a little bit old. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that is good. So next question. Um, so the bit of AI show is all about like learning new stuff, and kind of in our jobs, like every day there is like a new paper published, or there is some new tooling, or there is like so many different new new things. Um, so my question to all of you is, how do you keep up? What do you do to kind of keep up to speed and gain yes. new knowledge? Yeah, daily one paper. <laughs> <laughs> daily, I, I daily read one article um, of my interest, of my research area, uh, like related to education domain, but it's explicitly on. Uh, nowadays I'm working on, on explainable AI, so that's why. But daily one paper and uh, try to implement it, but if, if get time, otherwise. Yeah. So how long do you spend on that? Like, um, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, like half an hour, an hour a day? Mm, I'm, I, I actually read paper very slowly because I compare the other paper that I previously read. So uh, that's why it takes some, some hours, like uh, three or four, not one or, or half hours now. Yeah, there's a lot of time during yes, the day I, to yes, do I that. Spend, and I think so, it's good. Because I, I compare the, with the previous work and then I make my own inferences. And, and then I, I have to make notes for that. So that's why I, take, I give time to the paper to study. Okay, so in summary, you just, every day you pick a paper, yeah. you kind of read through it, compare it with all the other papers you've read, yes. and then actually trying to do it. Yes, I, and not actually, I make some inferences, and if I want to, I, I have some ambiguity, so to, clear, to clarify it, I try to implement it, there's some work, yeah. Excellent. Same for you, Koi. Yeah, I mean, I would love to say I sit down every uh, morning with my cup of coffee and I read <laughs> the latest paper, but um, I have two kids, so I'm not going to lie that I, I do any of that. I think my main source of the latest AI news comes through podcast, largely because I can put on my headphones on, my hands are free, and I am a proud listener of about 1.75x, progressing to 2x on the podcast, so I can also get through the podcast quite quickly mm. and learn the information. So, yeah. Excellent. So, podcast. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, I always try to have a hobby project going. Um, so I've been kind of resurrected this dancing project because I've got some presentations on that. But before that, I was looking at, uh, I was into music genre classification. Do you know you can actually do music genre classification with custom vision? Nope. I it works. 
Uh, you can just feed in, like, to convert the spectrograms into images, mm -hmm. and the image classification will do music classification. Um, so that was fun to look at. But I was also looking at using the, um, oh, is it Yolo 5 or something like that for music classification? There's um, a guy who's got a really good YouTube channel who uh, talks all about music classification and how you can do it with um, PyTorch and PyAudio and all that stuff. So uh, that, that was fun. And then I was also looking at... Um, uh, a few YouTube channels that I follow uh, religiously. Um, Sendex, uh, I don't know if you've come across him, he has uh, great stuff on. He started out with just learning about Python, so there's lots of introduction to Python, but then he has these crazy projects where he builds like uh, an AI to play Grand Theft Auto and an AI to play StarCraft and um, all this oh, type yeah. of stuff. And he'll do like um, you know a series of 12 videos on, um, on how to work with, with those scenarios, as well as some more serious and more work oriented stuff. And then I think Jeff Heaton as well, he's a teacher at a university and uh, he has um, a, good, uh, a good YouTube um, video as well. But mostly uh, I'd say I learn a lot of my stuff from YouTube, uh, just, uh, just watching through and then coding through as well. I like to be very hands on and kind of code along when I'm watching YouTube. That's uh, how I learn. Excellent. Yeah. So. Um I think you did also one presentation on like winning StarCraft. Yeah, yeah. So, the AI. Um, a couple of the Sendex projects, like the self-driving cars, that's kind of what first got me into AI. Was just looking at the self-driving car stuff, where you can do evolutionary learning for self-driving. That ended up being the lab on the Global AI Bootcamp, uh, managing to adapt a Microsoft sample racing game to actually learn how to drive around the track. And, beat humans, that was, a, that was a fun project to do and see people around the world uh, being able to actually play around with that AI. Yeah, so the, for people who don't know it, the Global AI Bootcamp is a bootcamp that is taking place all over the world in around two to 300 different places. So everyone can join like a local bootcamp and participate in workshops, in talks, in sessions. And the last two years it was all online, but hopefully this year, <laughs> we will be able to gather in, in, in person and learn again. And Alan, for one of the boot camps, he wrote this really cool game that all the venues could play against each other. And then we had like this big scoreboard about which one was trading the best model. Mm. And it was really cool. Lots of people participated in. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see um, the, you know the, the pins appearing in the map around the world and uh, and seeing all of the, um, the stuff. I was involved with the original Global Azure Bootcamp um, way back in 2012 or 2013, I think the, the first one. And the original idea was we were getting out. We, we'd be really excited if we had 35 regions around the world doing this. And now it's up to about 250 with the yeah. Azure one, and there's an AI one, and there's a DevOps one, and there's an integration one. It's it's going crazy. It's uh, really good to see. Yeah, it is really, really good. I think the Global Azure was like two weeks ago mm -hmm. also here, Corey. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So now kind of we know how you learn now, but you all already had a career for like a, a, a certain period of time. So I would like to kind of know how you got to like kind of this point in your career. Like what did you study and how did you move to your career for now actually working and doing AI projects? So the microphone is at you, Alan. So. Yeah, um, yeah. I started out, I'd always been hands-on. I mentioned that I'd always been tried to kind of be ahead of the curve on everything. So I kind of guess it started at uni, at uh, university, uh, in my final year. Uh, I'd done a year in industry and um, I remember being in a bar drinking beer with somebody who worked in the IT business and um, he says, what language are you working with? I says, Pascal, and he just <laughs> laughed into his beer and said, um, you're never going to get anywhere with that. You need to learn C if you're going to do anything in the IT industry. So I went back, did my final year project in C when everyone else was working in Pascal. And uh, I've always, before, there, there wasn't actually an internet, but um, they talked about this thing where you could talk to other people in other countries on some kind of network. And we just went, yeah, and ignored it. And um, I just read books. Um, so I used to go out and buy, you know, books on uh, you know, C programming, learning C++. And, uh, all that type of stuff, work with a lot, lot of hands-on stuff. But I don't know how, how you learned back in the day when there was no YouTube and no internet and you couldn't type a question into Google and get a code sample that you can well, copy and paste. And it. definitely just copy and paste, right? There you actually no had to go in the book yeah. and then if there was a typo in your book, what yeah. happened a lot, yeah, we, you, you were we kind of this, stuck. On Monday, the, the internet <laughs> shut down for a whole day at my place and I couldn't it felt like I couldn't look up anything or, or do anything. I was kind of stuck with the, the knowledge that I have for writing um, yeah. Python, which is pretty basic. I uh, couldn't re remember a lot of stuff I needed to do, and uh, it's really hard without the internet. So <laughs> yes. it's easy today. 
<clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so my journey, uh, so I first traditionally did a computer science degree. Uh, university in the U.S. is very expensive, and I got very bored of that because why pay for something so much that you already kind of know? So I stopped doing that, and I finished my degree in rhetoric or public address, so speaking, uh, which luckily made me persuasive enough to go back into uh, tech after a few odd jobs, and then I was working mainly on API integrations, so first e-commerce side and then uh, in payments, so not a very cool payment side of things, but uh, super important, obviously driving the economy. Uh, but I actually got into AI through this meetup group that we are here at now and kind of full circle because uh, we had the first meeting ever. So I wasn't founding of this. And uh, we had like a kind of tour of all the different AI concepts. And one of the concepts that came up to me was the generative adversarial network. So people watching the video won't know, but Alan gave a, just gave a talk about that. And I volunteered to give a talk, not knowing anything about AI. And again, kind of the same thing. Oh, this is supposed to be for MIT and Harvard, you know, PhDs. But sure, you know, I'll do a talk next meetup. And uh, yeah, it went okay. Not certainly not as good as Alan's, but uh, now I'm here uh, three years ago almost. So yeah, it's been a crazy fast journey <laughs> thank you for sharing and uh, in my case uh, i was studying and along that i was also doing job uh, i was uh, working with the uh, different software developers and website developer uh, and then i learned about uh, website development and software development skills uh, also studying and uh, after my master's, and I, I did work with a PhD student for sentiment analysis as an assistant. After that, uh, I, the, during my MS program, I worked in healthcare domain for, uh, uh, by using machine learning techniques to detect automatic detection of epilepsy. It's a mental disorder. So after that, I came in a education domain and I now I'm working in it here. And now you're here yes. talking and yes. sharing all your knowledge. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. That's so cool. So a lot of different journeys into like kind of into the AI space. Um, so we're going to round off with like the final question. Um, so we all know what you are doing now and what you've learned so far. So I'm very curious in what is next, the, the kind of next thing on your agenda, what you want to learn. Okay, the next, next is, uh, uh, I want, uh, currently I'm working for uh, uh, tools for education domain. So my, my basic goal is to provide quality education to the students. So uh, basic, my, my motive behind my work is this. So that's why I will focus on it and uh, provide more uh, automated technology-based tools to the different education stakeholders. Yeah, this is my goal. Excellent, I hope you succeed. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, um, for me, so I, I've been mainly an AI generalist for the last couple of years, just learning about AI concepts. Uh, but I'm really interested now in sort of the application in other future technologies, if you will. So uh, things like VR, uh, space exploration, there's many open AI applications to that, whether, you know, people can like launch a satellite if just normally as a normal human being now almost. Uh, so like, what do you do with all those images that we're gathering from the satellites? Like, how can we predict climate changing and things like that, as well as in Virtual reality, like everything is made up in virtual reality. And AI, as Alan had proved, AI is really good at making things uh, really quickly. <laughs> so like now we can make entire worlds with generated by AI. What does that mean uh, to people? How does the technology work? And then how do we put that in society? So I'm very interested in those spaces. Yeah, I kind of um, want to learn more about the basics of, of how stuff works internally. Um, it's you know, easy to download something from GitHub and, and run that code. but understanding more about model design and uh, effective model uh, design. I've been looking at, you know, training different neural networks when I was doing the music genre classification. You know, why should you choose 57 layers or 15 layers or 18 layers? What should you set as a learning rate? How long should you train for? And 
I think a lot of that stuff is built up with experience, just to gain more experience of um, of just working uh, with those those te uh, technologies. And I'm going to probably stay in the um, custom vision space uh, with Confinets and uh, and look at how they work. Um, I've also been looking a bit at object tracking as well, which is uh, interesting. I know Microsoft's got a, a good offering there with doing all the people tracking. I can't remember what's it called that technology. Part of the you can you do uh, track people in shops and see you know uh, how the customer flow is in uh, in shops and things like that. It runs on the percept, right? Hmm? It runs on the Azure percept. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what it was, I yeah, I, I can't remember the, the name of the, the, the technology there. But um, looking at doing something like you know um, having a, a web camera be able to count the number of cars, analyze traffic flows. Um, I cycle a lot into Stockholm, and sometimes you know there's as many bikes. Seems like there's, there's more bikes going into town than there is cars. And, be nice to be able to build up statistics on that and uh, be able to build solutions that use the object tracking, uh, which is kind of built on top of the object detection. Cool. I'll feel a new project and a new mm. presentation coming up yeah, yeah. in like <laughs> the next year. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for joining me into the, uh, in the Bit of AI show. And um, everyone at home, thank you so much for listening and I hope to see you in, uh, next week. Thank <laughs> you.